Hey guys, welcome to the ESD training presentation. So starting off, this is typically meant for new members who are wanting to get involved in the team and in order to do so need to obtain uh, lab access. But this is also useful for current members who are maybe wanting to brush up on their ESD knowledge. And this would be a good refresher for that. So with that being said, we will go ahead and get started. So what is ESD? Simply put, it stands for electrostatic discharge and we can further break down the uh, acronym into its individual terms, E standing for electro, S for static, and D for discharge. Okay, so here are some formal definitions that I think will be helpful to know moving forward. That being static electricity, electrostatic discharge itself, and electrostatic discharge sensitive. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide, so feel free to pause and read through at your leisure but there is one key thing that I want to point out, that being that third bullet point. So we do have quite a bit of parts and devices in the lab that are ESDS, and I think it's important to keep an eye out for them because if you know an ESD event does occur, they can be damaged or even destroyed. And the main point being is that it not only can set us back you know, monetarily in that they are expensive, but I can also set back our timeline quite a bit, which can you know, limit how much progress we're able to make. Moving forward, I want to briefly touch on this slide for a second. Here are two examples of ESDS warning signs. We have these in the lab itself right now. That being said, we won't always have everything labeled as such. So if you're ever in doubt, treat materials as if they were ESD sensitive. So moving on. How is static electricity generated? So there are generally two ways to generate static electricity, that being triboelectric and inductive. We're not gonna be dealing with inductive much in the lab because that occurs in things like you know dynamos and alternators, and that's just something that we're not gonna see. But triboelectric, we're gonna see every single day. And as the slide states, it's generated by friction and or contact and the separation of materials. So in this triboelectric, there are three things that we wanna consider. The material, the intimacy of the contact, and the speed of the separation. So as it says, the insulators will generate the most and conductive materials will generate the least. For the intimacy of the contact, the closer the two objects are, the more charge is generated. I believe this follows the inverse square law, so it'll dissipate off quickly as you, you know, put distance between you and you know, something that might be sensitive. And in addition, the speed of separation is important as well. So you know, the faster they're pulled apart, the greater the charge is generated. So there's no need to be you know, moving frantically in the lab. So here are some common static charge sources. These are things such as work surfaces, floors, clothes, chairs, packing material, and tools. All of these things are things that you might see in the lab, and it's important to keep an eye out on them because these are insulators and charges can build up on them if you're not careful. That being said, um, another thing that's also in the lab is people, and these are the biggest, uh, the single biggest ESD hazard that will, you will occur. Always conductive, you know, isolate, you got shoes on, they're mobile, they touch everything, you know, all these other things. So a lot of these, you know, things can be mitigated by just being careful and, you know, just paying attention to what you're doing. So moving on. Here are some general SSC lab rules that you'll want to keep in mind. If you're going to be working on something that is ESDS, you'll generally want to wear something made of cotton. So avoid things, you know, like synthetic fabrics such as dry fit because they tend to carry more charge and can be more dangerous to work with. In addition, you'll want to avoid long sleeves for the same reason, it'll carry more charge. You'll also want to avoid shuffling your feet or combing your hair, as these are all things that can lead to an ESD event occurring. Moving on, here is a table showing some common electrostatic voltages. You'll see that these are separated by humidity and that the, the lower the humidity, um, the higher that you'll see the voltages. It's important that we try to keep the humidity in the lab as high as we can. So in order to do this, we'll have a humidifier in there, especially in the winter months to try to up the humidity as much as we can. You'll see all these actions can cause, you know, electrostatic voltages to build up. And these are all things that you might be doing in the lab, maybe with, it, with the exception of, you know, walking on carpet. So moving on. Yeah, so this is this is important. So how much static does it take to damage hardware? You'll see that um, the lowest right here is a MOSFET at 20 volts. 
and it's important to note at the bottom, that bullet point at the bottom, people generally feel ESD at about 2,000 volts. And you'll see on all of these devices, the lower end of the range is something well below 2,000 volts. So even the most, you know, ESD sensitive person won't be able to feel these lower end of these voltages. So they might not even notice if they are doing damage to a component. And that's dangerous because there are different types of failure that I'll get to in the, in a, in the later slide. Um, that can result from you not even noticing that you're doing damage to it. So we'll actually go ahead and talk about that right now. So here are some types of ESD damage. The three presented here are immediate failure, latent failure, and a circuit upset. So that first one, the immediate failure, this is something that you might feel immediately as it happens. Basically, it'll render it, the ESD event will occur, it'll render the part useless pretty much immediately. That being said, identifying what part actually failed can be difficult and time consuming because it's not always evident which part was affected. The next one there, that latent failure, this one is actually really important as well because the ESD damage might not be severe enough to cause immediate failure, but it can lead to a failure happening later on down the road. And this is especially, you know, worrisome because we might have something, you know, or something completed and it works fine. And, you know, we send it off to the next step and all of a sudden something just fails. And we have no idea why, you know, we might think something else is happening when in reality it's that an ESD event occurred. It wasn't being, you know, someone wasn't being careful and it caused that part to fail at a later time. Um, and then that last one right there, a circuit upset. This one is also important because it can cause bits to flip. You know, whenever you're sending an electric pulse through, it might cause some sort of some. It might it might cause you to think that like the software is acting up, and you might spend a large amount of time trying to detect where that happened. When in all actuality, it was just due to an ESD event occurring. So moving on, here are some examples of these things that were just shown. Uh, so on that left is you know an ESD event in which it was an immediate failure. Uh, so we'll see that it was just shorted from one component to another. Uh, that second part right there, it's showing that capacitor failure, is just showing how small this can be and how difficult it can be to detect these things. And on the right is shown as an oxide rupture. So in the next slide, we have more examples of these failures. Uh, the one that I really want to touch on is that bottom right one. So this is a latent failure. You can actually see how it's starting to short from one component to another, but it's not actually in contact yet. So as that device is you know, cycled on and off, on and off, that part will begin to degrade just naturally. And that short will probably reach over and you know, connect to the other component and then you'll have something being connected that shouldn't be, uh, which is obviously not what you'd want. Uh, so moving on. Yeah, so the Hindenburg actually failed due to an ESD event and in addition with the hydrogen leak. So it, it, this happens in the real world. This isn't just something that, you know, happens in theory. Like, it actually can cause projects to fail. So we do provide ways to um, kind of protect against ESD. We provide wrist straps, and, wrist straps and lab coats. And then you can also just develop some habits that will help to, uh, you know, lower the chances of an ESD event occurring. So this wrist strap, this first bullet point, this wrist strap, we'll actually get, we'll actually go into a slide that talks about it a little bit more. But simply put, you'll want the metal portion touching your skin. You want to make sure it's tight, and you'll want to test it and make sure that you're grounded before you actually start working on things. Uh, this lab coat will come up as well. You know, if you're, especially once we get further into the project, and it's imperative that you have, you know, protection against these events. Uh, and then also just, you know, developing these habits, you know, it, it'll, it, it'll go a long way. So moving on. Yeah, so as I was saying, the wrist straps, uh, we have a device here in the lab. And all you do right now is you'll, you'll stand on it, you'll plug in your little wrist strap cable, you'll put your wrist strap on your wrist, and then you'll connect the wrist strap to a cable, and then you'll plug that cable into this device, you'll stand on it, you'll plug it into the side, make sure it's on the footwear uh, setting, and then you'll press that button and hold it. And if you pass, you'll see that green light with the pass. Otherwise, you'll have a high fail or a low fail. So you want to make sure that you pass this before you actually, you know, start working on things. Otherwise, you might not actually be grounded. And then as you leave this, you know, testing stand, when you move to work on your thing, you'll want to plug into the table because that will actually ground you where you're at there. 
We actually provide lab equipment that will make the mitigation of ESD easier. Um, so shown there on the left is an air ionizer, which is designed to you know ionize the air and which will allow charges to dissipate easier. And on the right there, we have ESD areas. These can generally be identified by the blue mats. You might even see that ionizer on the table. Um, and like I was saying earlier, uh, if you don't need to be in a certain area, just staying away from it's the best way to uh, avoid an accidental ESD event occurring. So more on these ESD workstations. They are, so you can see there in the middle, you actually have a common ground point that you can plug your wrist strap into. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, you have a static dissipative mat on the bench top. You'll have the ground point. Uh, you'll have, you know, there's there's some anti-static solution there. You can see in that picture. Um, and then we'll also have portable ESD controlled workstations. So if you need to move something around, um, you can, we actually have benches that you can plug your wrist strap into the ground uh, portion of an outlet, and then you can be grounded that way. Uh, these will be metal tables with the ESD mat on it, and then. Um, it's important that the, the, the clutter in the lab, if there is any clutter, you want to get rid of it because it can cause, you know, someone tripping on something obviously is not good because not only can they hurt themselves, but they can also, you know, damage components and, you know, things that we're working on. So moving on to some handling precautions. So this is actually a two-part slide. So this first part, um, you'll want to handle ESD sensitive items and ESD controlled areas. You want to keep them in shielded bags. I have another slide on that and a few slides. Um, and you'll only want to put ESD sensitive items on dissipative surfaces. Otherwise, you're kind of just wasting the surface because you want to keep that reserved for things that are sensitive. Um, and then shown there in that picture at the bottom, you'll want to avoid touching exposed search. You want to avoid touching exposed circuitry. So if you have to handle something, handle it by the edges. You don't want to you know press your thumb down on top of that you know, board as you might be causing things to connect that shouldn't be connected. So the second part, uh, like I said, handle all components by the non-conductive parts. Uh, if you have large shipping containers, you want to make sure they're grounded before you open them. And then in addition to the ionizer and the dissipative mats, the lab also provides nitrile gloves and anti-static solution if necessary. So the packaging. So shown there on the right is a static shielding bag. If you order a component that is ESDS, it will arrive in a bag like that. And it's important that we save these bags because it provides a quick way, quick and easy way to kind of store components that are sensitive. Uh, that being said, you'll want to make sure that if you are storing something inside the bag that it's sealed, because if you have things poking out of the bag, it's really acting as no more than a Ziploc. Um, also, you'll want to try to refrain from putting things inside the bag with it. So you won't want to put like sticky notes or something inside the bag because that can carry a charge on it. And if you put that inside the bag, then the bag is really not protecting it against anything because the paper's in there with it. Um, so yeah, you want to make sure it has a complete enclosure and you don't have things sticking out of it. In addition, secondary packaging that you might be using must also be dissipative. So moving on to the final slide. Okay, so in summary, we'll want to keep the humidity above 30% whenever possible. We'll want to make sure that everybody that's in the lab and is handling the sensitive items are trained to do so. So we'll, we'll make, want to make sure that they have, you know, watched this presentation or been instructed and then also uh, have taken the ESD quiz afterwards and pass that. That way we can be, you know, you know, verified that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, also, identifying the ESD areas, like I said, they're pretty easily identifiable by the blue dissipative mats on top, but it might not always be apparent for someone who might be in the lab for the first time what that actually means. We also provide ESD workstations with the dissipative surfaces, the common ground points, the ionizers, the coats, the nitrile gloves, the solution. So we'll provide everything that you need to work on something and you shouldn't have to worry about, you know, not have, not being, you know, properly equipped. Um, so there really is no excuse for an ESD event to occur other than, you know, just negligence or not being careful. Uh, and then th that final point there with the proper packaging. So keep components in the shielded bags if you're not, you know, directly using them at that moment, because that can also just, you know, prevent, you know, ESD from occurring. Uh, also, you know, pay attention to the secondary packaging, make sure that it's also dissipative, and they keep an eye out on the warning labels. Like I said, not everything will be labeled because sometimes, you know, it doesn't make sense to label everything as you're working on it as long as it's, you know, 
being properly handled. But if you do see an ESD warning label, definitely be careful around it because that is generally something that is ESDS, you know. So other than that, uh, that's all that there really is to talk about for this presentation. Um, there will be a quiz that you guys are expected to take. This quiz isn't, you know, we didn't write this to try to trick you guys or anything. You can take it as many times as you need. And there's also documentation in the drive that will um, talk about, you know, different things that I might not have talked, I, I might not have properly covered in this presentation, but that document will provide everything that you need to know in order to pass that quiz. So uh, yeah, that's all I have for you guys. Uh, take care.